Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Zinovia Gukhtenia. I'm art director of uh, Zinoviev Club in um, Russia Sivodnia, and I welcome you at our panel, uh, at our roundtable discussion, Who Rules the World, Love or Violence? Uh, many of you at the beginning uh, of this uh, roundtable asked whether it is a um, women's round table or whether it is a youth round table. It's not a bug, it's a feature. It's um, not a confusion within our club. Uh, we always give a f um, floor not to the representative um, masculine majority, but also to representatives of the other gender. And uh, so the topic for this round table um, and others are not as broad as for the panel discussion. Last year, for instance, we discussed 50th um, uh, anniversary of the Prague, uh, Czech uh, Spring, and this year I decided to focus on women, on their perception and opinion, and uh, give the floor to them. But uh, it's not uh, positive uh, discrimination. On the contrary, I think that we have uh, gender-balanced uh, representation here, so we welcome all um, speakers uh, to raise their wo voice, and uh, we welcome your comments. So the year, uh, the mm, 21st century is the century of diversity and uh, historical, political, economic and whatever uh, trends uh, cannot be considered only from the point of just one gender or one social group. We want everyone sp to speak. Um, not only at the panel, but also at the round tables, and that's what we do in the Zinoviev uh, Club. We give microphone to all those who have their opinion, no matter what the opinion is, and diversity comes into Russia, into Russia from the West in particular, and I think that's something developing. But Russia has its own history record related to uh, diversity and to a woman's issue. The matter is that uh, not a single uh, country uh, can boast uh, such a high level of uh, solidarity and independence as uh, women had in the Soviet Union. Women uh, worked, uh, worked at enterprises, were in science, in creative work, and uh, feminative uh, that is uh, now gaining momentum uh, in uh, the world. Uh, also took place and uh, did, did not make people uh, shudder uh, because quite, uh, quite often think that the feminine uh, form of certain words in Russia uh, goes against the grammar of the language. And women have always been uh, very important for families uh, and Russian culture is deeply feminine and it doesn't go into the format of belligerent um, matriarchate and not in a single culture, maybe correct me if I am wrong and comment on that, but not in a single Christian culture um, they have uh, the attitude to mother of God as in Russia but uh, well, the with the exception of Italy and I hope that my colleagues from Italy can comment on that. The picture looks nice but the dialectical principle is observed. There are challenges. I cannot uh, close the eyes uh, on, uh, on, uh, on domestic violence and decriminalization of this point, but we will not focus on this. I think that uh, much has been said enough, uh, in, uh, much has been said on this issue and other areas. And uh, when you women attend a forum on program writing or software program uh, writing, uh, there are some um, comments uh, with uh, criticism. What women you know about uh, software? But, so, but that goes on uh, verbal language. Uh, at the same time, uh, women uh, are taken care of uh, by men, they are helped with bags and uh, they usually open doors uh, b uh, before women. Women retire earlier than men and women do not uh, serve in the army. I mean, they are not obliged to serve in the army. So, but, so, the, 
different approaches to the women issue here, but I think here we are to think about violence and love. Uh, these uh, two notions are applicable to any human being. And um, I invite you to think about this uh, here today. So I invite uh, you to welcome uh, our friends and colleagues, um, Ginny Toscani, uh, Maratini Visconti from Italy. Um, we have um, Anastasia Fedina next to her, um, beloved uh, disciple of Alexander Zinoviev. Um, member of the Zinov Club, um, Anna Vivoda, um, advocate for human right, uh, rights in um, Italy, uh, Anita, uh, Anna Tsoi, uh, founder of uh, the Conflictology uh, Club, and Angelika Mirzoeva, um, and I introduced myself already. Um, so I will speak on uh, the time framework. Uh, so speeches of our guests should not exceed uh, 10 minutes. And after each presentation, I suggest that uh, questions should be asked to, to... Well, it's not the round table that we have. Let us imagine it in a round shape. Um, so I invite uh, the audience to ask questions uh, of clarification in nature from the audience and from all the members of this round table. And then we'll have a um, Q&A uh, session or a format of uh, comments. Uh, I, so I invite you to keep uh, to the time um, a little bit that we have. And comments from the audience uh, should not exceed two minutes. When you present uh, your uh, topic, um, use microphones, please. You press the button on the microphone. And comments uh, from the audience um, are also made uh, through microphones, so we we'll invite you to wait for the assistance to come. Um, so when we read the theme, the first um, word we, that we have uh, here is violence. So when I uh, see this and when I think about this, I think of war and aggression and uh, um, Mrs. Vinscotti is uh, the organization of the forum No to NATO, No to, Va uh, to War, am I right? Um, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Visconti was there in Kosovo after the um, shell bombing of um, Yugoslavia. So I think that, uh, if I understand it right, uh, I should like to share some episodes from this uh, life experience. So I give the floor to you. Everybody. Sorry, I don't speak Russian. I speak many languages, unless, but not Russian. You always miss one language. I'm sorry. Anyway, when I heard that I had to speak here about uh, what rules the world, violence of love, I was really worried because I didn't feel like pass a wrong message, and I didn't feel to feel, I mean, to sound negative. But in my experience as a freelance journalist on the war zones in many places, but particularly in Yugoslavia and Iraq, I've always seen violence prevail on love. And violence drags behind many monsters like destruction, hunger, displaced people, immigration, and worse. Violence leaves behind social chaos, backwardness, and what's m more and worse, especially in these areas, um, people are practically, um, how can I say, used for their religion beliefs, and they're dragged to follow political issues that they don't that don't belong to their religion and that is violence real religious violence those who suffer the most are of course the least protected classes of the population children who lose all security sometimes parents and they're they're special they're particularly displaced sometimes and they don't know where they're going and they're desperate and in the future their future uh, 
is uh, jeopardized by the fact that they're no, not going to find their villages, their people, their schools. They won't have the nutrition necessary to a growth, and we must think that children are our future, and this is one thing. Uh, violence makes women be responsible for the family because there are no men. In Kosovo especially, men were killed. And they have to bear this burden and think about, you know, how to survive in the tragedy and how to organize the family when they're fleeing away. And this is another, another terrible thing. But there's more. There's more, for example, in certain areas. Uh, women just lose their, their, how can I say, identity. They are treated like um, mares who have to produce many children because they have to raise the presence, the question, the, the presence of that ethnicity in that area. And I think this goes back to medieval habits where a woman is no longer a woman. It's a, 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 a sort of a mare producing puppies and children for other purposes. Well, I don't like to be negative, of course. Um, so, you know, thinking about all this, I just tried to find an episode that could be uh, positive, and I found it in the middle of a tragedy. When I got to Kosovo, um, it was just a week after the Kumanovo Agreement that stopped the bombing in Yugoslavia. And I was there with two colleagues, and we came down from Montenegro towards Pech. And the city was just dreadful, was totally destroyed. Um, it was just like, you know, a modern edition of a, a painting by Hieronymus Bosch. The incredible tragedy, you just had the idea you were in hell, with just the ghosts that were going around destroyed houses, violence, real violence. You could walk along a street, and all at once, in the full silence, a house would be set in fire. And um, at 6 o'clock, Albanians were starting raids against Serbs, and they were just, you know, um, kidnapping old men, and those men never came back. Uh, so uh, when I was there, um, I went to the uh, to the monastery of Pech, where I met, you know, uh, well, I used to know um, Metropolitan Philochie, and so when we were there, he asked us to, oh, by the way, there were, of course, a line of cars, you know, people fleeing, and uh, these people, of course, may, were mainly women, women of all ages, Children had been sent away, but, you know, these women were just protecting all the little things that belonged to the family. They, were, they had TV sets, they had, you know, a washing machine. They had all the things that were close to their family, were dear to their habits. And they had to, you know, run away with that. And uh, Amphilochie was organizing with the help of the Italian army that was, uh, that was covering that area. And the tanks were just right in front of the monastery because otherwise, you know, the monastery would have been destroyed. Um, they were just uh, gathering all the people that wanted to flee. And, you know, going up to uh, Montenegro, uh, they were accompanied by uh, the, the Italian tanks because otherwise they would have been killed. And we saw many scenes that, you know, they're not pleasant to, to tell. So um, Amphilochia asked us to sleep at the church of St. Jovan because we were sort of de a deterrent to any kind of uh, Albanian invasion to the church. So we did. We spent there three days. We were ready to go when um, the Pope come, came and he was with a couple of, um, of the farmers, two boys, two young, I don't think they were 30, and a couple. 
So we just we discharge the car. We put everything inside the car. The four people plus you know all their packages because they were fleeing. They were running away. You know they were abandoning their houses. And particularly, you know, the two boys, the two farmers, had two long, you know, bundles that they put in the car, and there was a terrible smell. In fact, you know, I turned to one of my colleagues and I said, what strange people, they're fleeing, they're running away, bringing their cupus, kisela cupus with them, you know, the acid cabbage. I said, but, you know, maybe they're afraid to starve, you know, you're going to bring... So, you know, okay, we went. And I drove the car through this street three kilometers long that was dividing St. Jovan to the monastery of Pech where, as I told you before, they were gathering all the people that wanted to run away. And um, it was totally in ruin, you know, everything was bombed, destroyed, tortured, uh, you know. It was not destruction, it was a destruction with pleasure. I don't know, it's, uh, it's different to understand if you haven't seen it before. So. I got there, finally I park in front of the monastery, um, the, ta the Italian tanks were there, and I opened the trunk and really, you know, all the packages exploded out. So the couple went, the two farmers arrived, they thanked me and they pick up the two big bundles, and at that point I realized what they were. They were those rubber corpse containers. These two boys were fleeing with their mother and father. They didn't want to let their corpse in a, in a land that was no longer theirs. And they didn't want, you know, the Albanian to, you know, do something to their graves. So they were fleeing away. I think that in a huge tragedy, when people are just running away, taking the most, the dearest things with them, I think this was a fantastic act of love. Thank you. I do not know even how to comment this. This story gets under my skin. Any questions of uh, clarification, maybe from those who are participating in the round table? Um, do you have a question? A question for me? Uh, well, yeah, nothing to add. No comment, I think. I've got a, a question, actually. This is extraordinary uh, story, the act of love. There is homo sapiens and there are homo uh, agape or uh, agape loving uh, people, so to say. In your understanding, as I understand it, violence is a tool or initiative of those um, powers that be. Um, they initiate this. I tried to put it rather careful or cautiously, but maybe that um, causes uh, something that changes attitude. What you said, uh, was it uh, presented in the mass media? Was it discussed uh, the mass uh, media? Tr did they try, were there any attempts to um, exert some influence on the better sides of people, on their better parts of souls? to show this, to bring into the surface? Well, absolutely not. Everything happened with the total silence. And I could stay here maybe hours to tell you stories like that. This was the most, I mean, uh, the one, I mean, it was a story that just got to my heart, you know, because I remember the destruction. I remember the fear. I remember the anxious, the anxiety that all these people had. I remember a um, woman in red with a, with absurd red, you know, tailor suit that was crying and was following, you know, the Metropolitan Philokia, asking about her husband, but her husband had been kidnapped, so he was lost. 
probably he was now a liver in some uh, in some in the body of some rich person because that was the thing that they were used to do all the kidnapped were used like um, how can i say um a, 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 a machine to produce organs you know so these most of these people that were kidnapped they were never found, but they also were used like organ producers, which is terrible. But I can tell you, these things were known by all the people that were there on the spot, but not a word came out, rarely, rarely. Uh, yes, of course, maybe the, the Serbian newspapers did. Um, but even that, you know, it was more... It was under silence, you know, it was not politically correct to talk about these things. Uh, but, you know, things like that happened in Bosnia, happened in Croatia. And unfortunately, most of the victims were Serbs. Thank you. Thank you. You've got a question. Just I want to ask about... Uh, just a clarification qu questions, if you permit. But if you manage uh, to do that within the two minutes uh, time work, okay. But just listening to you, I see that you see this as a um, act of violence, as a malignant. Um, something that is done with pleasure and that's the worst thing because there is violence of effect which is not conscious but what you are speaking about is something very pl well planned and measured something aimed at particular group of people we should be very aware that violence is something that brings uh, evil with it uh, something that brings destruction with it do you agree with this point i think you are absolutely right it was conceived it was planified, and uh, it was totally unnecessary because it could have been solved uh, in a very democratic way with uh, elections or referendums. But it's always better to, you know, uh, use violence because so that is, um, how can I say, deadly definitive. Спасибо большое. Thank you. Thank you for sharing these episodes. I think that that's something that we will take with us in our hearts and think a lot about this. The next person uh, to speak is uh, Anna. Uh, Italian uh, experience uh, I find very interesting because Italy for us is associated with the cradle of arts, the cradle of opera. Well, long story, but that's the way we see Italy, the motherland of arts. But at the same time, there are negative stereotypes, um, mafia, Machiavellian style of policy. And interesting to see how Russia also combines the traditional and modernist approach, uh, likewise with uh, Italy, a very beautiful country with dramatic um, past, with a lot of bloodshed. And as I understand, Anna uh, is to speak on this. The floor is yours. I'm very glad, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, Mrs. Xenia uh, and Olga and all the, club, the Zinoviev Club for being here. I'm very honored and glad of um, taking part of this important event. Um, actually, I just, uh, two words, I, I had the... Um, I was able to meet to meet, to meet uh, Professor Alexander Zinoviev many years ago, and um, I was fascinated by his uh, um, constant spirit of research, because I think uh, um, research is uh, it means uh, an intellectual uh, curiosity, which is uh, the the tool to overcome prejudice. So I think this is very very important, and it's a very um, a great message that uh, he left to us. Um, what uh, I'd like to talk to you today is the story of Lucrezia. Um, Lucrezia is a, is a wife of Colacchino, a, noble, a nobleman uh, uh, who lived uh, 2,500 years ago, so it's uh, uh, 509 before Christ. 
Um, Colatino was a, f a friend of uh, Tarquinio, the son uh, of the, 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 king, the king. They were friends, and Tarquinio went to dinner uh, at Colatino's house. He met Lucrezia, and he fell in love with, uh, with her. Um, one day, uh, when Colatino was away, he went to Lucrezia's house. Uh, Lucrezia thought he was a friend. So um, opened the house and uh, considered him like uh, a special guest. Instead, Alquino, during the night, uh, went in, in Lucrezia's room. He, was, uh, he had a, a sword and uh, uh, wanted her, with, first with menace. Uh, he said, I'm going to kill you. But uh, she didn't accept. She was very strong. At the end, she had to, when she was menaced with dishonor, and Tarquinio uh, obtained what he wanted. What happened after is that uh, Lucrezia was really um, humiliated and of the dishonor she had, uh, she had to, told this to her husband, and uh, um, she, they make uh, her husband swearing that uh, they would take revenge. But uh, afterward, Lucrezia um, uh, took a dagger and killed him herself. This is a very uh, important story for our uh, history because after that, uh, the Etruscan kingdom uh, end and uh, the uh, Roman Republic uh, began. But it's uh, a story which is quite uh, actual even nowadays. So, 2,500 years later, what changed? Actually, uh, every day in, in Italy and everywhere in the world, uh, there are women who have, who have violence. And uh, Lucrezia suffered violence just because she was a woman. I ask, how many Lucrezia are there every day? And most of all, how can we protect Lucrezia and her rights? So uh, let me introduce you just uh, quite quickly to the um, women's rights, the situation of women, women rights in Italy. Um, during the um, period of the fa uh, fascism, women were considered inf uh, less than men, so their rights were quite compressed. Um, here you can see some, some examples. Uh, so, for example, they have uh, less uh, money for the same work, or maybe, uh, well, uh, when it was. Uh, Possible to to kill a, a woman for dishonor was less uh, um, punished less than killing anyone else. The the story of modern uh, of, of woman rights, the modern story of woman rights in Italy, begins after um, the end of the war. So first of all, we have our constitution. Uh, which says that uh, men and women are equal in front of the law. Then, from 1946 to nowadays, um, the condition uh, developed and the woman had many, many rights. Uh, for example, the, the vote, first of all, the vote, the right of vote, uh, the um, reform of family law, uh, divorce, uh, abortion, and many possibilities also in, uh, in jobs, in uh, politics, and many, uh, many steps were done since, done since then. But uh, nevertheless, uh, still many obstacles, we, we still find many obstacles uh, which are inherited from the past that prevent us from achieving gender equality. Because, unfortunately, stereotypes condition thoughts, and we still have many of them. 
So, um, the, the sources of our legislation uh, um, to, to protect women's rights are both uh, uh, national from Italy and also international. We have many um, uh, law from, uh, well, we have indication from uh, uh, United Nations and also from Europe. One of them is very important is the Istanbul Convention. It was signed in 2011. It's the Convention of the Council of Europe on preventing and combating violence against women and domestic violence. It is very important for us, for Europe, and also for, for Italy, because, uh, first of all, it, it says that uh, recognize violence against women like a, a, form of, a form of long tradition of unequal power and relations between men and women. It has a structural nature, and it is one of the main social mechanisms by which women are forced into a subordinate position compared to men. And in this convention, it's written that achieving gender equality is the key to preventing violence against women. Principle. I will remind you about the time limit that we have. Gives um, four main principles. They, they are so called, they, they so called four P's, which is prevention, protection, prosecution of uh, perpetrators, and integrated policies. So, after this, the effects of the Istanbul Convention in Italy is, first of all, the increase of social alarm about violence against women. Then, uh, the introduction of the concept of feminicide, which is uh, the international, in, intentional killing of femi, for, uh, females just because they are females. But uh, feminicide is also considered a uh, uh, something bigger, like uh, uh, um, any form of systematic uh, violence against women exercised by men, usually family members of, of partners, to subject uh, women to uh, physical or psychological control and annihilate uh, their identity until death. Anna, I have to remind you of the reglement. Mm -hmm. You have one minute. One more minute? Yes. <laughs> We'll yes. ask questions. So we had a general sens uh, sensibilization of this problem. This is a, a murale uh, in Rome. Uh, after that, uh, we had new laws to protect, uh, to prevent, especially to prevent uh, uh, violence against women. Uh, this, they are very, uh, very important because in this, uh, we, with this law, we uh, have mo a more severe uh, punishment for uh, crimes ag against women and also some more crimes and a system of protection. Um, the the aim, main aim is to speed up the intervention of authorities to protect, uh, protect the victims. But uh, in Italy, we are trying also to do a, a, a policy of um, uh, education to respect, uh, beginning from school. Because uh, we are, um, uh, uh, the sensibilization, sensibilization of this uh, problem uh, um, um, by the sensibilization, we can understand, we understood that violence can be uh, done in many ways. It can be um, psychological, physical, sexual, and also economic. Uh, uh, of course, it's difficult to understand when, in, in, within a family, what is uh, real violence and what is uh, a, a familiar conflict. Nevertheless, domestic violence is a big problem 
for Italy and I think also for many places in the world. Another interesting aspect is that uh, violence against women can cause um, a serious, uh, can cause effects also in economic, because first of all, women work less, but of, most of all, because they, uh, violence can cause many disease. So uh, violence has also an effect on health, on general health of the society. Uh, during the last five, day, five years, uh, uh, the feminicides against uh, these facts, the killing of females, um, had uh, uh, they, uh, they reduced, we reduced the, the number of uh, feminicides. Nevertheless, we still have uh, a lot to do to, uh, to solve the problem. So I don't know if, if this is the end. <laughs> Спасибо большое. Thank you. Will we switch off the mic? Will we switch off the mic? Will you switch off the mic? Uh, yeah, I think that that's really interesting uh, topic and this very interesting excurs into the legal um, situation and uh, rights uh, situation with the legal rights of women in Italy. We in Russia have a saying that to kill an idea you need to instigate it. Don't you think that um, this fight for the rights of women in the West takes some absurd forms? For instance, uh, I saw that uh, I have first-hand experience. For instance, when I went uh, abroad uh, for the first time, I was warned, just don't try to uh, be a gentleman, don't try to be gentle to women in the West, because that may be regarded as a harassment or disrespect to women's rights. Actually, yes, sometimes uh, the, the fight for uh, women's rights can have uh, uh, strong aspects, of course. But, uh, um, you know, what happens is that uh, if so someone is not uh, listen, you have to, if, if someone doesn't listen to you, you have to, 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 to speak louder and to, uh, to scream. To scream. To, to be understood. So maybe this is the, the, the reason. Thank you. Yes, actually, I wanted to ask a question on this and discuss, suggested a discussion um, of uh, this um, high attention to women's rights and uh, everyone, I think, uh, heard about Me Too. Um, Movement. What I think, sexualization of everything that uh, was launched after 1968 uh, had its apex in uh, the 1990s, now subsiding or just fading away. Maybe through Me Too movement, uh, we are entering a new Victorian uh, era that uh, has leaves its imprint. Everything, uh, everything that is about sex. Uh, Everyone has his own or her own identity. Everyone has sex with whoever they want. But real love, real attitude, real relationship, and holistic relationship stands uh, is left outside. Is uh, left outside the parenthesis. So we are switching from emoti emotion, uh, emotions to ra uh, r r rational approach. Uh, so there's so much shouting about rights, etc. So people lose the ability to perceive as a human being. A person who is uh, um, eager to uh, be compassionate. So I invite Anastasia to, to think about this and to share with us. Anastasia Fedina. So I would like to, uh, to speak with you about uh, the following. When we uh, speak about love and women's rights, why we lose uh, meaning? Why do we come to this? Uh, why it happens that people who feel life and uh, are viable, they are bewildered with the current situation? What is in their foundation? 
and what and to keep the meaning in mind we need to discuss things what do we want on the one hand we want to understand what is violence and what is love where do they bring us but sometimes there's violence in love and we also can find love in violence as well so I don't think that we can diverge these two concepts, put them apart. Then we need to come to the understanding what is love in um, the created world. And we're actually united on the basis of Bible. Well, forgive me, but uh, I will refer you to the book of uh, um, Genesis, and uh, there are many interesting things written there. Maybe we'll acquire this uh, meaning there when God created creatures of uh, the earth and sky, uh, and those that live in the sea and underground. And He created man and woman. He said, "Live and multiply." So, the man and the woman were created before Adam and Eve were created. And then on the seventh day, he decided to relax. So he worked before that. What he created on the day of, uh, on the Shabbat? Uh, he created paradise with the river flowing and from the earth of the clay, he created Adam. Adam is not quite a man. He is the creature that was created well God created man and woman but Adam was created in the liking of God and what did he give to Adam to give names to all the created um, creatures except for uh, those that lived in the sea so Adam began to give names to things and to creatures and if we look through you know, the evolution in the, and look into Kabbalah this is Hoem Holem, Holem, uh, you may know, is the robot. So, Adam had the function of uh, cognizance of the world. Then uh, God looked at Adam and uh, put him to sleep and created not a woman, but a wife, Eve, from his uh, rib. And said, you are flesh from flesh. So, there were unity but in two hypostases and that's extremely important we need to think about the world at the level of knowing in this unity then you will not tear apart you will not split into parts but you will be separate entities so when he did this he said he brought them to the tree of knowledge tree of good and bad or evil he said don't eat fruit of this tree because you will die well in the synodal translation into Russian we find this but you will know the death why they, uh, they ate the fruit and didn't die but and lived for quite many uh, years so this knowledge that is given to you will be destructive to you not just you will know the world, recognize the world. This, um, and uh, Adam and Eve were driven out of the paradise and they had to toil and to earn um, their living. But they didn't live far away because they saw cherubims uh, who were put to guard the gates to the paradise for nobody to enter. And they gave birth to two sons, Cain, who began to work on the earth, and Abel, who was the shepherd. There were no such creatures in uh, the paradise. So what happened then? In one of uh, the days, uh, God watched them and he told, uh, addressed Abel, I will, will take care of the fruits of your hands. So he recognized uh, the fruits of his hands and Cain uh, well, 
emotions took over in Cain. If we look not at the synodal texts that were approved in 1728 in the Trident uh, Council, um, but some other um, texts uh, that were not that the fathers of the church were not guided uh, by. So if we look at the apocryphic uh, scriptures, we'll see Cain worked hard. Uh, he worked hard on the land, and uh, Abel just um, took care of sheep. He was a shepherd. According to the apocryphic scriptures, a raven came to him uh, and dropped dropped a stone uh, on, um, on a, a little bird and killed it. And so Abel threw a um, stone into his uh, brother and then dove uh, came and brought a worm and put um, this worm in underground. So that's what Cain did with Abel. So where is your brother as God? I am not guardian to my brother. Who go So a new intellectual idea. Who was guardians of the paradise? Cherubims. So he tr said the uh, truth. I am not a guardian to my brother. And so God sa told him, um, the land is futile now, is barren now, and you cannot work on it, and I will be killed. That's what Cain said. S in 70 generations uh, will be cursed the person who kills you. So he has future. He set up uh, the town of Hanach. Uh, he was the father to many uh, sons. And as it is said in the uh, Bible, when there was enough uh, people, there was enough men, then daughters were born. So sons were the founders of various crafts, and daughters were um, founders of various arts. And then uh, um, Adam had another uh, son, Sif, and these were the root of new civilizations. So Eve, as a woman, as a wife, f fulfills all the functions of love. And we have Christ who said, God is love. So that's something that makes us think that when we see uh, some shameful, uh, shameful things, we do not uh, die with disgust, but we look for a way out. So, because love, lo love is something that brings us to creation. A loving heart may help the one who is dying. A 67-year-old a um, um, Socrates uh, took Alcaviad uh, Al from the battlefield and saved his life with this. That's something that we need to delineate. There is a certain essence, a meaning that gives us energy. And it's related not with destruction, but with creation. And so people, as a result of that, have got this. They, um, their knowledge, knowledge is not only creative, but also destructive. They become craftsmen, but also they develop um, weapons of destruction but how things should be done in such a way that we can preserve ourselves as a unity that means that we need to rework our mentality we need to think about the world as um, a unity and this is possible only through love from this point of view we can resolve many things but we should not think ourselves as a, in a position who oppresses whom but who plays which role in the world? Our life makes sense only if there are other people nearby, only if there is humanity. The life of humanity makes sense only if there is the earth, the universe, and we have something to live for and to move forward. So this is something we should bear in mind. This methodology of not looking at who is right, who is wrong, but look at this from a different point of uh, view. What is the basis for creation? What is uh, for constructive things? This 
strange creative feeling of love does not mean sex. Unfortunately, I have to intervene and uh, remind you about the time framework. I think that this topic deserves a separate um, session on or to consider uh, within the uh, Zinoviev Club religious teachings. That's enormously interesting. Do I understand that love is an act of creation, uh, act of creativity? If we take uh, the globalization era when uh, not the personality, not, the, not love, not compassion are the cornerstones, but money, benefit, well, we need to think about creativity, not to be liked by others, but to express yourself so that uh, you're drawn by all, um, with others, just to, to, to be one with others. Just brief questions, if possible. Gentlemen, first, please use the microphone. Love your neighbor as you love yourself and also love your enemy. How do you understand with this? What does it mean to love uh, your enemy? Well, that's a, that could, um, that's a problem. You may hate yourself, not love yourself, or even commit suicide. When, so when you say, read, uh, love yourself as your neighbor, in some contexts this may bring you to creative things, but in some other contexts you, you may you may be brought to destruction and love your love your enemy anyway, actually love your other the other is very important uh, and uh, that's the fact of cognizance by um, uh, Zinoviev, only then you will be able to unite with him. If you do not uh, understand that other person, then you will, know, you, will, uh, you will not be able to come to common terms with him. Well, uh, I invite you not to enter in the discussion. Ksenia says, uh, what's your name? You didn't... Uh, Valentin Ivanovich, I suggest that if we have time left, then we will discuss uh, who rules the world. I invite uh, Lyubov Nikolaevna to, to speak on, to take the f uh, microphone and uh, I think, well, I will ask uh, our assistants to help with the presentation. So uh, first I would, since we turn to Bible, uh, that's very difficult, for, uh, especially to the academic, uh, atheistic uh, thinking. If it was Adam who had the cognition function, and um, Adam uh, got into knowing of Eve, and she bo uh, gave birth to son. So uh, knowing means also um, fertility or insemination. Was there love between them or not? We do not know this. If we want to know something, that means uh, that we need to infertilize that uh, something. Otherwise, uh, nothing will be born out of that. So just in continuation of this theme of uh, knowing, if there is no um, fertilization process, nothing will happen. It was, uh, the, the son was born to them out of knowledge. Um, oh, speak out of microphone. Well, we follow the text. That's the way you interpreted this. I just get back to the text. So Adam knew, um, entered Eve, or in Russian it is, got to know Eve, and thus she gave birth to uh, her son. So now we get to uh, my presentation. Who helps me with... You have the clicker. You have the clicker. So I need to come closer. Will you give me the microphone? The, the factor of cognizance is well described in his uh, in Zinovia's work. Knowledge is passive, uh, but um, learn, um, no, uh, knowledge is passive, but understanding is active, and understanding comes with effort. For this, we need to make some effort. That's what Zinoviev wrote. Uh, 
uh, and to think um, about love and uh, violence. We need to think about certain categories. We can uh, feel, experience, have compassion, but what will we put into the foundation? That's the question. We, the round table is called violence and love. Seem to be opposite notions, but I look at these two concepts um, uh, from the point of an intellectual exercise without the empirical um, uh, attitude. Uh, well, I will leave the practical experience aside. Uh, that's what we heard from Jeanine, but we until we get some distance from the event, we will not be able to realize that, to comprehend this um, event. Well, I took this approach to core relations between the man and the woman, and I said that all contradictions can be found in this opposition, everything that we have in the universe. So there are two uh, two uh, notions, uh, phenomenon and uh, noumenon, um, and I'll try to uh, uh, stay at this notion. Um, so, governance and uh, management, peace, violence, and love. Let's see what is behind this. So. Management and governance. Ma management is a function. It envisages only certain, um, um, a certain understanding of uh, something whole or system as a whole. Uh, there was um, a philosopher, Wittgenstein, who said that uh, management is a prediction and uh, we can predict only something that we construct ourselves. Can we say that management is a certain... Um, uh, something that we predict and governance, governance is an artificial process. What is world? Uh, world is a reality. We see something, what we like or we dislike, we um, respond to that, that's a phenomenon. But there's also a world in uh, the category of thinking. Uh, why we react like that, what is the basis to that, and wh what are the reasons to believe uh, that we think in the right uh, way. Um, Shidra, uh, George Shedravitsky, as uh, Zinoviev's uh, disciple, spoke about a person as an acting person and a, as a thinking person, uh, the world of uh, reflection. What is, uh, what is the world? That's the world of an actively cognizing uh, the world. So when uh, we speak about knowledge or cognizance, uh, that means, yes, getting some knowledge and fertilizing something. So what is violence? So violence and the two, first two presentations were on um, about two um, entities, a weak one and a strong one. Without this, there will be no place to violence. Violence, And it is also envisages some destruction. But what is love? Ontologically, it has no definition because everyone has a, his or her own definition of love, depending on, on our experience. Here we can lean on Eric Fromm, who said that there is a division between in us whether to have something as a property or as some being. So I invite everyone to think about uh, to think about this and read Eric Fromm's "To Have or to Be." If I own you as a thing and you do not subdue to me, then there will be violence because I treat you as a piece of property. But it's a different thing when we speak about being. It doesn't matter whether the thing that we love or the person whom we love is. We are still in the state of being with this person or with this thing. Who rules this world? Love or uh, violence? Judging but what is happening in this world, I think that it is the violence that dominates. We should not breed illusions on this. But violence envisages some deception. I seem kind and friendly to you, I will mm, rape you then. I give you a Trojan horse first as a gift, but then I will destroy you. Um, well, this is the role models, uh, those 
you, we can follow as uh, our guidelines. There should be no place to violence. That's some ideal that we are exploring. But where can we find uh, some examples, role models, um, something that uh, we can be guided with? Not, a, uh, not in a single ideology or anywhere we can find these role models but for the Bible. In the Orthodox Christianity we have the um, saints and those heroes who always defended the Russian land. We want to think about the future. We want to have future imbued with love. But unfortunately, it is violence that rules the world. Zinovi says that life in ideal is not devoid of meaning, but it is uh, truly um, it, it is truly uh, it truly represents the human life. We need to understand that we lose something as well. The dichotomy of uh, life, the contradictions that we have, this gap uh, between hatred and love. Um, are in place, but they are linked. One does not exist without the other, and Zinovia's works showed that brilliantly. When he were, uh, was in these two states, um, that showed us uh, very well. He also thought about love and what is love, the dream of love. And um, I read this poem. I will read it out loud. I want to call you a goddess, but um, the line is uh, broken and I call you a bitch. I uh, embrace the whole um, universe with my uh, winged uh, dream, but you still pursue your uh, tactics. What about your uh, wages? I want to call you a goddess, but I call you a bitch. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, that's about ha oh, hatred and love, and uh, that they're tightly, uh, tightly linked. And when Fedina spoke about uh, love and hatred, well, that brought us to the same idea. There is a mixture of that. Uh, we live in this mixture continuously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and this is a very deep and integrating uh, presentation. If you permit, uh, Lyubov Nikolaevna, I would like to ask a question to you. Yes, take your seat, please, and switch on your microphone. The question may seem to me at the level of uh, bachelor uh, student, uh, first um, sophomore student, uh, but uh, is it possible to put uh, love in some instruments, in some, into some tools? Well, love is, uh, love is a state of being, and this is illogical. Being is illogical. Uh, it is something that can exist here and now. But logic uh, is something that is related with the past. Love is here and now. It cannot be turned into a tool. As soon as you apply some tool to your feeling, the feeling will be dissolved immediately. It becomes non-existent. So love cannot be instrumentalized. I believe so. This is a philosophical category. May I use my right of the moderator? Maybe uh, there are some questions from our panelists. I would like to ask you a question. What about respect? Respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Вопрос в том, что вы думаете о респекте? Прокомментируйте респект. То есть есть любовь, уважение, респект. Респект, уважение, да. Yes. What? What? Um, what do you think about respect <laughs> as a tool to solve the problem? <laughs> you can love, you can do a lot of things, but with respect for the other person. 
Well, we say that we respect uh, people of a senior age, we respect heroes, we respect participants of some events. But I think that respect can take place in two uh, situations. Those who protected their fatherland, the state, deserve respect. And respect is also here and now. You cannot achieve respect through your past owners. Uh, it is here and now allows you to assert respect. What is um, respect for people of senior age? We have the only difference uh, with the young. Uh, we have more sins than the younger. Just um, I believe uh, that uh, Zinoviev would answer also a very honest way. It doesn't matter uh, that you're a professor or a doctor of science. It's not something to respect. But here and now, you can be respected only for what you can do here and now, in reality. Uh, uh, first, we'll give the floor to Anastasia Fedina to ask her question or comment. So I suggest first to Anastasia Fedina to give her comments and uh, we'll get to discussions then. Mm. Uh, that was out of the microphone, sorry. Being is uh, determined, well, the way we uh, recognize uh, being, well, uh, is based on reality, on the way we uh, learn about the reality. Uh, Madam Visconti. Well, your time will come. That was the question from the audience. And I would like to give uh, the floor to uh, Genia to uh, Toskovic. Actually, I think your idea of respect is quite traditional. There is also another respect. Normally, we have a small territory around us. And that territory should be respected. So even from men and women, it's a question of respect. Respect could solve a lot of problems. Well, uh, the gentleman uh, repeats once again what was translated into Russian because Madam Tsoi didn't hear uh, the translation. There is space between men and women and that uh, should be respected. Am I right? I will respond to this. Not a single space deserves the respect. It is us who generate the space. And uh, we should not own um, or give uh, some animated quality to something that is inanimate. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter what is between us, but until we uh, just have the space between ourselves, there is nothing to respect. Just uh, one by one, um, I spoke about the time limit. In well, I hope I was uh, clear. So inanimate things do not deserve respect. But things that men and uh, women do can deserve uh, respect or may not deserve respect. Thank you. Uh, just a short question, if you permit. Yeah, we hear definitely. So I uh, heard the word of construction organization, and I would like to give the floor to Angelika Mirzoeva, who is an architect. I believe that she can say something on love as an act of creation or some creative act. Because you understand it in the terms of space <laughs> or dimensions. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm grateful for this um, opportunity to be uh, with um, such wonderful women and to listen to your um, to your opinion. Uh, but I will uh, just escape from your proposal uh, and I will ask uh, a question to uh, Madam uh, Tosca Visconti. I put down some uh, thoughts. Um, uh, she said that uh, she uh, saw. Um, uh, in Kosovo, uh, uh, that women were treated as a mare who were just produced children. I recognize your shock, and uh, I believe that uh, being in that situation, things uh, they couldn't perceive the whole situation in a different way. But for the future, I've got a question: What uh, do you see in the woman? What do you? 
uh, think of herself not as a mayor for reproduction or giving birth to new children? What do you think as a, um, what would you say about her role in the future? I think the, the best thing of all is just going back to the word respect. I think that a woman should be respected in her choices, which means if she decides to be, you know, a housewoman, okay. But if she wants to have a career, she shouldn't be opposed. She must have her career and then decide what to do. She, if after the career she would like to be a mother, but if she decides not to be a mother because she has no time and she prefers to have a career, that should be respected. By the way, you know, I might say something that can be uh, politically incorrect. But, you know, in my country, for example, I realized that gay couples get along much better than normal couples. And you know why? Because they respect each other. They are on the same plan. I mean, uh, on the same level. So whatever happens, they discuss... They, they, uh, they agree on things, but always without attacking the other one. They might have fight, of course, but it's not attacking deeply somebody, you know, in its own personality. And for me, this is respect. May I contribute to this? Thank you for your answer. And I want to say that uh, you gave an example of a pair of gays, um, a gay couple, but also um, we spoke about reproduction or future children. How can we... So you ha it's a rhetorical um, way of... Um, presenting things just through questions. I actually wanted to ask such a question as well. Let us ask this question together. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you ask me about reproduction, having children? You know, what I objected in those areas I was telling you about is that these women, women are not asked about what they would like to do. Sometimes they are imposed to have a husband and they have to produce as many children and sometimes divide this husband with other women. Even if, and this is happening in Bosnia, for example, nowadays, and by the law, by the Bosnian law, each man should have one woman and then divorce. One man can't have many women and produce many children. But it happens. And somebody close, I mean, the, the powers... The Western powers, they are there. They just close their eyes and they accept it. That's why, you know, I'm quite revolted. Yes, then I understand your point of view. Thank you. Thank you for your questions and answers as well. I think that we can uh, get uh, to the Q&A session and uh, we have about 15 minutes. Well, please do not forget to introduce yourself. Uh, Dmitry Rade. Uh, vice Rector of the um, Rational Thinking School. Russia is entering a period of another transformation. Um, a 30 year period elapsed, a new generation has come into the fore. Um, 1989, 1991, now another cycle of 30 years is launched. Uh, the, the, government, uh, uh, the next government of Russia may uh, consist of women. Why? Why may it be much better? Russia, during its history, experienced uh, some uh, periods of prosperity under uh, women rulers. Women uh, can uh, organize harmony. If we reword uh, this uh, formula of violence and love, we can put it as opposition and harmony. So women c can create, are capable of creating harmony. So we have opposition. Opposition with Japan, for instance. Since the ABBA uh, is set, uh, is uh, very pushy, is very um, 
pressing in his, in the urging in what he does. And with Trump, we also are in opposition with him. And uh, if uh, a woman, beautiful woman, comes uh, to gets to the negotiation table, or um, for instance, uh, uh, Miss Paklonska comes there, goes there. Can they do anything against it? I don't think so. What will happen uh, if Russia will start um, forming uh, harmony, not opposition? I'm about to conclude. Thank you for reminding me about two minutes. So uh, there are not only uh, a policy, maybe not only public, not only is the one that is in the streets. It is done in semi-closed uh, uh, clubs. Ksenia Alexandrovna, I've got a request to you. Form a feminine, um, a woman's political club for the youth that will give birth to a new um, government uh, headed by women. I thank you for this idea. I think that's good to, to work on this. Ksenia, if you permit me. Well, uh, this proposal or hypothesis that government uh, will be headed by a woman because we used to have uh, rulers um, among women in Russia. Well, good thing. But they were rulers because not, not one man was uh, next to them, but many women. Are you, uh, do you agree to have many men around this woman? And that's what we had in our history. Are you ready for such a wife uh, who will have many men around uh, to rule the state? Любовь Николаевна, maybe they should be not just men and women, but thin, uh, thinking human beings. It's not about men and women. But the history shows us one thing and the other. But there were many men standing around this woman. Can we give uh, many men, uh, thinking men, uh, not, just, um, not just male uh, beings? So if uh, women ra uh, reign, then uh, men will relax. Anastasia Fedina, uh, do you want to have some comment on this? Uh, well, the problem uh, of relations between men and women, uh, violence and love, are absolutely different problems, I would say. And the question how many men a woman can have is just about individual development. If we want uh, to be in unity in our society, should have certain principles set in its foundation. If uh, life becomes void or uh, senseless, no matter whether we want a love or not, we will destroy society. If life goes without sense, if we do not understand why we live, if we have any uh, con concepts that are, that are illogical, bring us to the point of no sense or no meaning. It's not a matter who can what, but what can be presented by a single human being. They can save somebody or can destroy somebody, murder someone. And for this, we need special tools. And these tools are still to be discovered. And if we do not do this, then definitely we will destroy ourselves and we will die. That's what Zinoviev wrote, that uh, the humanity will die not because of a nuclear weapon, but because of its own folly. I think that the lady in pink uh, would like to say something. Yes, the woman in pink would like to say something. I agree. Uh, Olga Panchenko. Uh, Ksenia uh, Alexandrovna, in uh, which year? Uh, in the year 2000, together with your dear father, participated in the round table spiritual upbringing, how our understanding for the 21st century. Since that time, um, since that time uh, I have thought, um, I have seen uh, the world changing to its better uh, form, uh, to gain more um, colors. I think that Alexander Zinoviev then spoke about many things that uh, came from the future to us. And in this regard, I would like to hear uh, about your feelings, your thoughts, because you're the daughter of your father. What do you think about spiritual upbringing? 
How should we understand it in the 21st century? Thank you. Yeah, that's truly a good uh, question. I believe that, well, when we think about spiritual upbringing, it's not something that we need to get uh, in, uh, to link with religious thinking. And evil is created through the evil intention. For instance, weapons is just uh, some um, mechanical tool. It is only when it is used for evil purposes, for murder, makes it evil. Alexander Alexandrovich used to think, think, um, realize things and act through this. I like the parallel between the Bible as the first uh, book with the capital letter and the legacy of my father that gives the key to understanding what are we to do with ourselves, not just to live and think, although that is very honorable, but our contemporary world calls for a broad understanding in the concept. I think that um, spiritual upbringing and education, and please understand me right, I like Nietzsche's uh, concept of be above uh, yourself, be above your own stars. That's not to fight God, but as what uh, Anastasia Mikhailovna Feridina said, curiosity. Or was it Lyubov Nikolaevna who said about uh, curiosity? While the person um, learns something, they uh, live and develop. This continuous work on yourself is or uh, something that we can call uh, the spiritual upbringing or spiritual education. Yes, please. Violence can take different forms. One's of, uh, one of the forms of, of violence is taken by, um, well, is represented by mass media. For instance, and mass media plays an enormous role in the relations between the West and Russia. From our point of view, from the point of view of the Russians, things that are happening now in, uh, with, uh, towards Russia can be perceived as an information violence uh, towards uh, people of Europe. But in Europe, they believe it to be just a defense against Russian prop propaganda. What do you think it is? Is it an information violence or is it a defense against propaganda? Whom are you addressing this question? To our guests from Italy or? No, no, just whoever wants to answer this. Ginny? <laughs> okay. I think you're absolutely right. You know, uh, media, unfortunately, they're not free. Uh, they all depend from uh, a power. And if this power wants to defend herself, because actually, uh, let's talk about United States. United States have colonized Europe. Europe is very weak. I think we, pay, we still pay the consequences of the war. And, for example, something that maybe you don't know, um, after the Marshall Plan that helped Germany and Italy a lot in uh, 48, 1948, in 51, Italy had to sign a contract with the United States granting territory for the U.S. bases. And up until now, Officially, the Pentagon says that we have 59 bases, but actually there are more than 109. So the whole country is, for example, uh, an American colony. We cannot even decide the government we want without an okay from Washington. And so at this point, if United States decides because they were afraid to lose power, because they want to have the market, because they want to be, uh, you know, in a first position uh, always. But it's always a defensive situation. They attack with the media, and they invent stories. For example, what we had during, uh, during the Cold War were a lot of stories. And normally, the Russians 
you know, were guilty in these stories. Because one of the things that United States does is just to create an enemy. But now, more and more with Internet, people are aware of this, but they can't do anything. That's why, for example, I was a freelance journalist because I, I could get wherever I wanted without, you know, depending from anybody. So I saw things that others saw the same way but couldn't write as I did because they always had a family, because they had a career, because they had, you know, a salary, because they didn't want to lose it. And sometimes, you know, there are unbedded people as well. And these unbedded people, of course, they're granted, for example, a career. There were a lot of journalists, even German journalists, that at the end of the story confessed, you know, that they had been on, on the payroll of the United States. So you're absolutely right. The only possible way is just to try to tell the truth the more, the, in all the possible ways. Internet is also a good way, even if through Internet you get a lot of wrong, uh, fake news as well. It's complicated, and you're right. Thank you. Um, Oh, it's time for us to wrap up. And uh, Madam Tsui, if you have just a little bit to contribute to that. As for information violence, um, this is discussed in the State Duma. Uh, domestic violence is being discussed now. Uh, various types of violence are mentioned, economic, psychological, but information violence is not um, included. What uh, who can uh, be exposed to information violence? Those who have no this ability for crit critical thinking. And to have it, we need to educate people, we need to form their culture. Then there will be no exposure to uh, information violence or will, have be, will be protected against this. Uh, on my behalf, Zinia says, I would like to thank all contributors to the discussion. I think that we have a very animated discussion and we are uh, well, uh, we came to the virtual to conclusions that to save ourselves from this uh, racing um, and pacing um, globalized uh, uh, pressure uh, can be done only through thinking, through giving space to others to speak and th through various forms of respect. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a short coffee break and then uh, the next, uh, the concluding panel at uh, quarter to four in the presidential room. <laughs>